Welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage at the Museum of Science. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our annual Nano Days event. It is the biggest event for the smallest science. We have activities going on all throughout the museum. We have a lot of hands-on activities going on downstairs. We'll have special presentations on this stage all day. And we also have the amazing Nano Brothers juggling show happening upstairs. But without further ado, let me begin with the future of computing with quantum materials. So if we're going to talk about computing, I'm wondering how many of you are familiar with using computers? Who here has used a computer, laptop, smartphone, or tablet in the last day or two? Excellent. It's most of us, because they are a huge part of our daily lives. They play a role in the car that drove you here. They run the T system, if you took the T here. They run the museum's ticketing system. They run a lot of the exhibits here, obviously, including this show. But just 20 or 30 years ago, who would have predicted all the ways that we use computers? Did anybody in the audience grow up without a computer at home? Anyone? Yeah, it actually wasn't that long ago. Um, now, the quotes that were circulating before the presentation began were meant to show you that even experts in the field had a really tough time predicting what the future of computers would hold for us. For example, John von Neumann, who was one of the world's first computer scientists, Back in 1949, he said, we've reached the limits of what it is possible to achieve with computer technology. Now, that's kind of a silly statement to say back in 1949. He was quickly proven wrong. But to his credit, he had an inkling he might be, because he added, one should be careful with such statements. They tend to sound pretty silly in five years. Now, I'm going to try to tackle a very similar challenge and predict what the future of computers might hold for us you might be laughing at my predictions in five years, but I'll take a shot nonetheless. So I'm going to start by trying to answer these three questions for you. The first is, how far have we come? In other words, how have computers changed over time? The next question is, can we keep going? Or the trends that we've seen in computers, will they continue into the future? Or are there barriers that we need to overcome if we're going to keep improving our computing? And finally, where do we go from here? What kinds of technologies and materials will take us into the future of computing? So let's start with that first one, how far have we come? This is the Harvard Mark I, one of the world's first electronic computers. You could see this thing was massive. It was built in 1944 by a man named Howard Aiken. And John von Neumann, that computer scientist I just quoted, used this very machine to do calculations related to the Manhattan Project back in World War II. Now, you can see this thing was big. It took up an entire room. It was 50 feet long, and it weighed five tons. Now, this thing had the same computing power as a calculator. So obviously, we managed to take our big computers and shrink them down to be a lot smaller. Now, for its time, the Mark I was incredibly powerful. It could do three calculations every second. But if we compare that to one of our supercomputers today, this is the TH2, the world's fastest supercomputer in China. This thing can do a lot more than three calculations a second. It does 33,000 trillion calculations every second. That's a 33 with 15 zeros after it. So obviously, our computers have gotten a whole lot more powerful. Now, another place that you've probably seen those two trends yourself and experienced it yourself is with cell phones. I actually have a cell phone from the 1980s here. This was incredible technology. Picking up a phone and talking to someone wirelessly, that was a really novel idea. Now, 30 years later, though, my smartphone, my iPhone, well, first of all, it's a lot smaller, lighter, easier to carry around than that big old brick. But what's really special about smartphones is that they do a lot more than just make phone calls. For example, my iPhone also has a camera built into it, so I can take photos. In fact, I can even capture video and watch movies with my iPhone. It has a GPS that tells me where I am, where I'm going, and how to get there. I can play music on my iPhone. I can play video games on my iPhone. And essentially, it's like a little mini computer where I can check my email and shop online and do all sorts of work. So 
All of these technologies and many more have been shrunk down to fit into this tiny little package. Now that really summarizes the trends that we've seen in computers. Computers have gotten a whole lot smaller over the years, but at the same time, they are so much more powerful. Now, is that going to continue? Will we have, in another 10 years, something as powerful as an iPhone be the size of a button that I can just clip on my jacket? Or will something like the TH2, that supercomputer, be the size of a laptop or desktop computer? Well, we're starting to realize there might be problems that we need to overcome if we're going to keep improving our computers into the future. And one of them, I'm sure you've noticed, if you've ever sat like this guy with your laptop sitting in your lap, have you ever noticed how much heat they generate? Yeah, your lap can get really hot. There have even been burns on people's legs just from the heat from the laptops. Now, the injury is beside the point. It just highlights a problem that we need to overcome if we're going to keep improving our computers, managing that heat buildup, which is pretty substantial. Now, I'm not saying your computer is going to catch fire anytime soon. But computer chip designers have actually had their computer ch chips melt on them as they test new designs and architectures, because some parts of your computer can run as hot as an electric stove. Now, that's why inside your computer, you have things like this, heat sinks and fans. Here's a heat sink right here. This is a really important part of your computer because it dissipates that heat and keeps the delicate electronics cool and prevents them from being damaged. Now, you might be wondering, what on earth is happening inside a computer that actually generates all that heat in the first place? And if you were to look at the heart of your computer, it's really the CPU chip, that microprocessor, a little square of silicon about the size of a dime. Now, on that chip, are literally billions of tiny electrical switches called transistors. Now, these transistors are really as simple as an electrical switch that turns on and off. So when it's off, there's no electricity flowing. When it's on, there is electricity flowing. So there's only two states to the switch. When it's off, it represents the zero of computing language. And when it's on, it represents the one of computing language. And that's how your computer works. These little tiny switches going off and on very, very quickly, representing the binary language of ones and zeros that your computer uses to store information. So all of your data, your movies, your photos, your games, all of that really boils down to a bunch of ones and zeros, which seems really far-fetched. I mean, how can something as complicated as a movie really be ones and zeros? So all of the complicated information is broken down to small, tiny pieces of information. And every tiny piece of information is, is coded for by eight ones and zeros, or eight off-on switches. So this pattern of offs and ons, or ones and zeros, is the binary code for the lowercase letter a. And this pattern of ones and zeros simply codes for the letters of my first name, Kareem. But it's not just letters and numbers. It's actually different parts of your computer take ones and zeros and do different things with them. Your graphics card interprets ones and zeros and gives you different color pixels on your screen. Your sound card takes ones and zeros and gives you different sounds or tones that you hear. So all of that complex information is broken down to tiny, simple bits. Each are coded for by ones and zeros. So Think about the complicated files you have on your computer. You're talking about um, megabytes and gigabytes of information. So these chips n actually need to have millions and billions of tiny little switches that turn off and on very, very quickly to, to deal with billions and billions of ones and zeros that represent your complicated data. Now, if I'm going to fit a billion of anything onto something about the size of a dime, those switches, those transistors, are probably pretty small. They're tiny. They're nanoscale. They're only about 20 to 30 nanometers in size. Now, to give you some size perspective, that's really small, because we don't measure stuff in nanometers in our daily life. But if you were to take a single human hair, the thickness of the hair is 100,000 nanometers. So transistors are thousands of times thinner than a single hair. That's how we fit so many on these little tiny chips. But they weren't always that small. 
The very first transistor in the 1940s looked like a little mangled up paper clip, doesn't it? It was about a half inch tall, and they didn't even know how it was going to be useful. In the 50s, they shrunk them down and they put them on chips. This is the world's first integrated circuit. It had two transistors. And ever since then, we've gotten really good at shrinking transistors, fitting more and more in our computer chips, so that every two years, we've been able to double the number of transistors we fit on our computer chips, basically improving the power of our computers, letting them store and process more complicated information. That trend you may have heard of as Moore's Law. And it explains why the computers in stores are two or three times better than the one you have sitting at home. It's not your imagination, it's because more transistors on the chips means your computer can store and process and do more stuff. So on our latest computer chips, we can fit as many as five billion transistors on that little tiny square of silicon. Now that brings us back to our two problems that we've been facing. First is heat buildup. Think about all that electricity going through a billion tiny little switches on a little space. It's just the resistance of that heat moving through those switches that generates all that heat. If we put more switches on those chips, it's just going to generate more heat, and that's a problem. Now, the other problem is size. Now, we're running into the physical limits of the tools and processes we have for making transistors even smaller. And at that tiny size scale, some weird quantum effects start taking over. That means those transistors, they don't necessarily operate the way they've been designed to. So there are thousands of people all over the world that are working on finding solutions to these problems so we can keep improving our computers. Today, I'm just going to tell you the story of some folks that we work with at the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials. They have some ideas for some new materials that could help us with these problems. And I'm going to talk about three of them today. The first is graphene, the thinnest material ever discovered. It's a single atomic layer, and it could lead to ultra-fast devices. The next material I'm going to talk about is diamond. Would you believe they're looking at diamonds and how that could improve our technologies? And finally, I'm going to talk about a new class of materials, topological insulators. They were just discovered a few years ago, and we're still figuring out how they work, but they have a lot of promise, too. So let's start with graphene. Even if you haven't heard of it, it might remind you of another material that you do have experience with, which is graphite. Now, all of you have used graphite before if you've ever used a pencil. That soft gray material inside a pencil is graphite, and it's made entirely of carbon. Carbon arranged in these hexagon-shaped carbon sheets. Graphite is many, many layers stacked together. So we have a layer of carbon atoms stacked upon another layer of carbon atoms, billions and billions of them. When you write with a pencil, you basically leave chunks of carbon behind on your paper. Now, because carbon is pretty common, we don't think about its special properties. But we're going to test to see whether it has any special properties. I'm wondering who in my audience thinks that pencils can conduct electricity? Raise your hand. A couple people do. Who thinks, no way, pencils don't conduct electricity? Raise your hand. OK, a few more people. And I think a lot of people are kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. So I have a circuit here. I have a light bulb, a battery, and a couple wires. The pencil I have here has been sharpened on both ends, exposing the graphite that runs all the way through the center. When I hook up this wire to the other end of the pencil, if the pencil connects electricity, the light bulb will go on. Are you ready? And it does. Pencils conduct electricity. But you know what? They don't even do it that well. There are a lot of impurities in graphite. So researchers thought if they could isolate a single layer of carbon atoms, that's graphene, they thought that should be an amazing electrical conductor. Electrons should, in theory, be able to zoom across the surface at super speed, unimpeded by impurities. Now, how are you going to isolate a single layer of atoms? Most people didn't even think it was possible until just 10 years ago, a man by the name of Konstantin Novoselov and his um, colleague, 
uh, Andre Geim, they managed to do it using scotch tape. I kid you not, they won a Nobel Prize with scotch tape. So what they did is they took some scotch tape and they touched it to a crystal of graphite, that little hunk of rock you see up there, and when they peeled it up, they noticed a little bit of the graphite had stuck to the tape. Then when they took the tape and they stuck it to itself and peeled it apart, they noticed that it seemed to be kind of separating and they did it over and over again. They stuck the tape, unstuck it, stuck it, unstuck it, over and over and over again. And what they eventually did was peel apart those layers of graphite, peeling it thinner and thinner and thinner until they'd isolated a single flake of graphene. And once they did that, well, it just revolutionized this whole field. Now, luckily, we can actually grow graphene. We don't just have to use the scotch tape method these days. Um, but if we're going to incorporate graphene into some of our technologies, how are we going to build something at the atomic level that's too small to see? Well, there are some amazing techniques. And using a transmission electron microscope, you actually can see down to the atomic level. The images at the top, that honeycomb pattern you see, you're actually seeing a single layer of carbon atoms. And there's a little hole that's growing bigger and bigger and bigger as you go left to right. What these researchers at Harvard have done is use a single silicon atom, chiseling away one carbon at a time, knocking it away, chiseling this hole. So techniques like this show that we can actually have some control at the atomic level. And this could help us build devices with these two-dimensional materials to take advantage of that super speed of electrons on these atomic layers to bring us to ultra-fast devices. They, they also generate less heat. Now, I'm going to move on to a different material, and I'm going to talk about diamond. Because everyone loves diamonds. They're incredibly beautiful. They form these these gorgeous crystals. They're very hard and strong. Um, and we make them into beautiful jewelry. Now, the little tiny diamond crystals you see up here have colors. Those are due to defects in the diamond. Boron gives us blue defects. Nitrogen gives us yellow and orange defects. Um, now, what you might be surprised to learn, though, is that diamonds aren't just found in nature. We can actually grow real diamonds in a lab. And when we grow them, Basically, we're taking carbon and we're forming this kind of crystal structure. Each one of these black pieces represent a carbon atom joined to four other uh, carbons. And they form that incredibly strong, hard crystal. But as we're growing it, we can control that growth. And for example, we can remove two carbon atoms and replace it with a nitrogen atom and an empty spot. And that gives us what we call a nitrogen vacancy center in the diamond, an NV center. Now that defect, because we've isolated that nitrogen atom, we can control it. And we can control a special property of it called spin. Now quantum spin is a little different from like the spinning of a top. It's not the same. So if an atom has spin, it basically can only have one of two spins. It spins up or it spins down. That's all you have, up or down. That means that one atom can store a bit of information, a one or a zero. So one single atom could store a one or a zero. That brings memory in our com current computer hard drives from about 50 nanometers for a little magnetic domain down to the size of a single atom, which is really exciting. But Again, we run into that problem. How are we going to put diamonds in our computers? Some researchers at Harvard at the Lanchar Lab, they've actually grown these diamond nanoposts. So this is a single diamond uh, crystal. And what they've done is they've etched out these tiny little posts. And every single tiny pillar, that nanowire, has one nitrogen atom isolated inside it. And using lasers, they can read and write out that information. So we actually are getting closer to the point where we can incorporate these diamond materials into a technology that could store information. Now the last material I'm going to talk about are topological insulators. Now these are a very mysterious, brand new class of materials. They were just discovered about seven years ago. And we're still figuring out how they work. But the uh, most special thing about these materials is that they conduct electricity. So the center of it 
is an insulator, but the edge conducts electricity, only the edge. Now that's kind of weird because most materials, they conduct electricity all the way through it, around the outer edge, through the middle, all the way through it. But a topological insulator is only around the edge. Now, what's also special is that those electrons move at super speed. They're not affected by uh, defects at the surface, and they move incredibly quickly. And we can control them. So we could give those electrons spin. They can be spin up or spin down, spin up or spin down. And once we assign it a spin, it can only travel in one direction. Its movement is tied to the spin. So for example, that red bit, spin up, can only move clockwise. The blue bit, spin down, can only move counterclockwise. It can't be changed. The material forces it to move in this way. Now, how is it that a material can guide electrons to move that way? It doesn't seem possible. Well, the way you can think about it is to compare it to kind of being left or right-handed and how that might guide your own movement. So for example, if I'm going to walk around the edge of the table using my left hand as I, my guide, I put the left hand on the table and I start walking forward and I'm going to get all the way around the table. I can walk all the way around, but what I can't do is I can't turn around and go this direction as long as I'm guided by that hand. Likewise, if I take this hand, my right hand, I put it on the table, I walk forward, I'm going to go this direction. I can't turn around and go the other way. So the guidance that it does with electrons is similar to being left or right-handed, kind of guided in one direction or the other. And that means that if we, once we give an electron spin, a one or a zero, it's going to be transmitted perfectly from one spot to another. It can't be changed, it can't turn around, it can't be altered. And that could lead to perfect error-free data channels. So these are just a couple of exciting new quantum materials that folks think have a really exciting prospect for improving our computers in the future. Dealing with the power issue, dealing with the size issue, dealing with the heat issue. And the idea is that it's very likely our computers will keep getting better, smaller, faster, way more powerful well into the future thanks to a lot of these new materials. I hope I was able to uh, shed some light on quantum materials for you a little bit. We'd like to thank the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials and NSF for supporting this work. I'll be sticking around to answer questions. Otherwise, enjoy your day here at NanoDays. Thank you so much.